This workshop is led by Matt Christie. Matt is director at TRC. He consults to utilities and state agencies nationwide on residential energy efficiency and decarbonization policies and incentive programs. He has devoted his career to advancing all electric and zero net energy residential buildings into the market. And um, Matt is also a member of the Stratford Energy and Climate Committee, which I'm part of, um, and he lives in Stratford. So we're very excited to have you, Matt, and I'll let you go ahead. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Geneva. Thank you so much, Michael, for having this and, and hosting me. So yeah, I'm Matt Thank Christie. I live, I live in Stratford, and there's our nice little townhouse there. And part of my career is to spend lots and lots of hours uh, pulling apart things like the Inflation Reduction Act and making sense of them and helping um, my clients um, work through them and, and uh, help their consumers and contractors that work in their territories understand them and apply them. So I spent a lot of my time on this act. So have a little bit you know, more chance to, to dive into the weeds and know it. So I'm gonna go over some of the details of it. Um, and I'm really gonna focus on um, what it means for like for us, for a Vermonter, right? For, for someone who's living in Vermont, making practical choices to try to decarbonize our own lives or support the community around us make those choices. All right, so I'm gonna start with kind of a big picture pull out first that the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, was a very big deal. It was a huge bill. It was very impactful. It had a lot of stuff. The consumer facing provisions within it that I'm going to go into the details of is a, frankly, a pretty small subset of what this bill does in totality, both financially and uh, projected impact. But it matters. And that's you know, why people are here to kind of learn what, what can you do. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the low-income provisions, the HERA Act and the HOMES, um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the tax credits that are involved, and then I'm also going to talk about the electric vehicle tax credits, who are kind of their own little beast, um, and then we'll take questions. All right, so the Inflation Reduction um, Act was a really big deal. Um, those of you who are political wonks like me um, probably tracked a lot of the Build Back Better saga and all the stuff that the Democrats were trying to do when they took control of um, the House, the Senate, uh, barely the Senate, uh, both barely, and, and the, the presidency, and you know, probably frustrated by all the backs and forth, and then all of a sudden, okay, this new bill, the IRA, came out kind of out of nowhere right at the end, and, and maybe your instinct is to think, well, I'm a big climate for, person. This is what matters to me. I'm sure that bill is pretty bad relative to what we were first trying to get out of this um, particular congressional session. And the answer is you, you'd be pretty wrong. Like this, the, the, what fell out of the Build Back Better Act was things regal, was most of the stuff around childcare and elder care and healthcare and, and other sectors, but the climate provisions, almost all of it came through entirely intact. They lost a, one big chunk on um, uh, power plant support of uh, green energy uh, at the grid scale. Uh, one mechanism Joe Manchin didn't like and pulled it out, but we really got almost everything that we wanted. Um, in the totality of the IRA, there's about 350 billion in climate action spending. That's most of the bill. Um, it's covering homes, it's covering electric cars, it's covering heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, it's covering uh, grid energy storage, it's covering renewable energy uh, at the grid scale and grid level. Uh, there's a lot in this bill. I would never be able to, to capture all of it. I'm mostly going to focus on the, the consumer stuff. Um, but it was, it was a Christmas tree bill. Like for, for us in climate who've been pushing this, it's the first, it's the only, the only federal bill that really pushed for climate change in the history ever, right? We've had, we've gotten close. We've had some little micro things, but this is the first time our federal government has ever touched climate and they, real, and they touched it big in a lot of different ways. Um, just tons and tons and tons of things in here um, for anyone to be pretty appreciative of. And the impact of the bill, this is data from the Repeat Project, which is a, um, a, a, a group at Princeton who does energy modeling. It's one of three groups that do energy modeling for this type of legislative work. Um, all three of them use very different modeling approaches, and all three of them came in at sim very similar um, results. So you can feel, have some confidence in it that there's not some method, you know, not just some magic and a false methodology. But as you can see here, you know, black is business as usual, or, or, or history. 
Um, black continuing is, is sort of the frozen policies, business as usual. This light orange is what we would have gotten if we had just passed that bipartisan that infrastructure act that got some press earlier on last year. It was like, it's got climate stuff. It did not have much climate stuff, right? Barely a dip. Um, and then uh, purple is what we got, the Inflation Reduction Act. And green is what the original Build Back Better would have done. So you can see, right, we're, you know, we got, we got almost all of it. Um, blowing in, you know, zooming in to just, you know, from now until 2025, you can see same, same chart, same everything, but you can sort of see it better that we basically got get about two thirds of the way down to the zero energy, the Paris targets, our Paris commitments, just in this bill. And this doesn't account for some things in the bill that are not modelable, like the green bank. And it doesn't account for a lot of the add on effects we might get from state action that can build off of the tax credits and off of the provisions in this bill to help carry us even further forward. So the wonks that study this on the big, you know, Jesse Jenkins at the Repeat Project and those that really dive into this stuff, they're pretty stoked. They're pretty happy. They, they think that this last third is, is achievable, either through more federal action, possibly, or through state action, um, or just through the response to the market maybe being faster than what the modeling allows for, which the modeling tends to be um, conservative in nature, typically, generally. Um, but you know, who knows? It's modeling. So with all that big picture stuff, uh, what's going to funnel down to you, uh, you know, fellow Vermonter who's just trying to make some good decisions? So there's two chunks. One is the low income provisions that are coming through. And going to start with just we, we don't know yet, right? There, we have no idea, like some of the stuff is not passed. Um, oh, that's not supposed to be an animation. So, well, that's odd. Um, Hopefully that doesn't continue in my slide deck. Um, I'll just say what I was going to say. So um, the low income stuff is all, it's all in rulemaking still, right? There's, there's two big acts they got passed, they're in the, but the, the, it uses very general language. It sort of says, it stipulates, this is the dollar amount. These are some of the specifics, but it's gonna be up to the Department of Energy and then state agencies to actually implement them and put them in the market. And we don't expect that to happen to, to us to know exactly how these are going to play out until late in 2023, possibly early 2024. The first of those two is the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Act, HERA, as people sometimes are calling it. Um, these graphics, by the way, they, these charts that I'm going to show a few, they're coming from Rewiring America. Um, which has a website with a lot of great fact sheets and tools. So I started building my own tables and realized they'd already done it, so borrowed. Um, so going to Rewiring America, if you want to learn more on some of these things, um, good fact sheets, good info. Um, so within this act, uh, low-income residents, people at under 80% of area median income, can get 100% of their costs covered for these products, um, up to a maximum of $14,000. Those between 80 and 150% of AMI can get 50% of their uh, costs covered. Again, up to these limits by technology or by sort of, uh, you know, line item and a max consumer rebate of 14,000. Um, to put you into context for our area, for most of um, the Upper Valley and Woodstock in particular, um, AMI is about $90,000. Uh, it's 90,000 in Woodstock, it's 84 in a few spots, it's 95 in a couple towns, but that's that's about, you know, that, that'll benchmark you. And there's a great little tool here. If you want to write down that URL or kind of find it on Google, you can look it up. Um, a little caveat to that, that's sort of generalized AMI. There's a chance that this will be implemented with a, um, a more granular scale by number of occupants in the household, by household size, right? So a different AMI for a two-person household than a six-person. We don't know yet. Again, that's that's in rulemaking. We're not sure. I would expect it to kind of be a, a generalized AMI because it's easier to implement, but who knows what, what they come out with. Um, in this bucket of money is was dedicated, was appropriated $4.3 billion. When you spread that out across 50 states and 10 years, that's not a lot of money, 
right? It looks like a big number. But when you really spread it out, it's not a lot of money. It's probably going to run out pretty quickly. So my guidance to anyone who, who is in this um, income bracket or has peers that are that are thinking about this is start researching what you want to do early and getting a sense of visualizing your own home with a heat pump or, a, or an induction stove or a, you know, whatever it is that you're thinking of doing, get a sense of what it is. Maybe even start talking to contractors, get an idea of what you want to do, lining them up. And then when the whistle blows and the money is released, be Johnny on the spot and be ready to jump in and try to take advantage of these programs when they launch. Um, we, this will, this hopefully, this is intended to be a point of sale rebate system, which means um, the, the money is discounted directly to you. So it's not like you have to sit on the cash and get it back at the end of the year on your taxes. It's, it's directly, it'll flow through the contractor. Your contractor, you know, your, your X thousand dollar bill will be rebated directly to you and you'll only pay the, the post rebate amount. Um, we expect, but again, rulemaking, we're not totally sure that this will be stackable with the existing Efficiency Vermont and Green Mountain Power incentives and rebates, um, but that's at the state's discretion, right? There might be, who know, again, rulemaking. Um, and I would guess that this money is going to funnel and be implemented by Efficiency Vermont themselves. Um, again, speculation, not totally sure, but that's probably where it's going to come from. Um, and it, it might like dovetail in or, or train in with existing Efficiency Vermont programs. And you can say it's covering a bunch of technology, right? So heat pump, space conditioning, heat pump water heaters, um, electric stove tops, cooktops, um, heat pump clothes dryers, breaker boxes um, to upgrade your, um, your, your amperage in your house, your service, your electric service in your house. If you're on an older house with 100 amp service, you're gonna need a, a 200 amp service probably to cover electrification. So that's covering, pretty much covers all of that change. Um, wiring in your house to like, you know, putting out all the electrical work you might need to do to put 200 volt amp, um, 200 volt circuits and rest, uh, receptacles in some places, um, plus some money for um, some basic weatherization work. All right, the next component to the act I want to talk about is the homes program. So this one's even less knowable, like the, the language in the IRA itself is very vague. Um, so we're, you know, even more speculation in this one than the last one. Uh, what we do know, what's in the statutory language is retrofits uh, with modeled savings of 35% or more um, can get 4,000 bucks up to 50% of project costs. Retrofits with a lower percentage savings can get 2,000 bucks. And then retrofits with uh, measured savings of 15% or more get this payment rate per KWH saved up to 2,000. Um, and that's all it says. So all the details beyond that, how is it measured? How is it modeled? What are the rules? Who's allowed to model it? How do you get it? Who's, you know, no one knows. Totally, and you know, we, we have no way of saying it right now. Um, again, 4.5 billion in this pool. That's for the entire country. That's gonna run out quickly, just as, as the same. Um, this one's actually not just uh, low income. This does cover all households but the incentives are doubled for those below 80% of AMI. Um, this one, you cannot stack with HERA or tax credits, right? So if you take credit for in a, in, in a modeled scenario, so a modeled scenario just means like someone ran an energy model to predict the impact of various energy features, better insulation, a better water heater, a new heat pump, whatever it is. And that modeled savings is what your, your tax credit or your, your rebate is gonna be based on. Um, if you use your heat pump in the model, you can't also get a tax credit for that heat pump or have gotten that heat pump at a discount through, through HERA, right? You get it in one bucket or the other, but not, you can't double dip into, into multiple. That's what I mean by it can't stack. Um, and the other thing that's going on here that's in the act is this, uh, this, this writing about it using an energy efficiency aggregator approach. Which basically means like sort of some nonprofit company or, or for-profit company comes through and they, they kind of put it all together for lots and lots of houses. They do all the work, they put some of the, the capital forward, they take the risk, and then they reap a big portion of the reward and a smaller portion gets moved on to you, the consumer. 
for maybe like the first 10 years and or first five years, some, some period of time. And then thereafter, the energy savings all flow to you. So they would probably end up taking the actual rebate dollars and then they would probably share with you the monthly energy savings that you get, right? Versus what your bill would have been otherwise. That's pretty complicated to put together, um, but those that work in the aggregator field, there's a great company called Sealed that's really trying to do this. It's, it's uh, made, uh, the, the executive director at Sealed is like over the moon with this. He thinks it's the bee's knees. Um, I trust him. He really knows this market and really has read the statute. Um, so I think there is reality to that, that this aggregator approach could be, if it's set up well by the state agencies and the DOE, could be very valuable. All right, so those are the HERA Act and the Homes Act. Um, let's talk about all the tax credits. So there are uh, four buckets of tax credits. The first one is the Energy Efficiency Home Improvement Tax Credit. Um, this is for, uh, this has no limits. So this is, this is for heat pumps, insulation, doors, windows, electrical panel upgrades, and energy audits. There's no limit to this money. It's a tax credit, right? So it's not an appropriated fund. It's just however many people take it. Um, it's available right now. Um, I actually was very lucky. I had my heat pumps installed the first week of January by total happenstance because I had signed up for them back in May and I am now eligible for this tax credit, which I wasn't expecting to be when I signed my, uh, my, my agreement with the HVAC contractor, but lovely. Um, this is a non-refundable tax credit, which means you must have federal tax liability to claim it, right? So you typically, that means someone who's working age, who's earning enough to have federal tax liability against their income uh, is the typical scenario. And then um, this isn't part of the deduction. This is just a tax credit. So once all your, your you do deal with all your deductions, you still, you know, you owe the government X thousand dollars, you can take a credit up, up to these levels off of what you owe them. Um, Non-refundable just means right, you have to have that liability. Um, it also means you can't roll these over, right? So it, you use it in one year and you're done. Um, what it does mean though, is that there, it's, it's annual. So if you do some work this year, say you get a heat pump water heater, take your 2000, you know, next year you can do a heat pump space heater and take that 2000. Um, you might in, do your windows upstairs in your, you know, in, in a few of your rooms this year and do more windows next year, right? So you can, you can do this over time. It's going to be available for the next 10 years. So it does allow you to keep taking tax credits year on year if you continue to do work year on year where you're incurring a cost that complies with the requirements. <clears throat> As you can see, there's sort of an annual limit of 3,200 total kind of in two buckets, um, 2,000 bucks per year on these heat pump options, both the heat pump space heaters and the heat pump water heaters, and 1,200 bucks across all the others. So, right, if you take 1,200 bucks for insulation, because you had a, you know, did a big insulating product, you can't also do windows, take, you can't get the credit for your windows in the same year. So it's a little bit limiting that way, right? Big projects, big sort of fully comprehensive products and holistic projects where you really go all the way there, you know, you're going to just hit your maximum and, 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 and cap out, um, which is a shame, but also you'll be in a much better house. So you get that benefit. Um, with all of these, the, the structure is that it's, it's 30% of the incurred cost or the dollar limit, whichever one happens to be lower. So in almost all cases, it's going to be the dollar limit. Right, most of the, you know, a new heat pump in a home is, even if you just get a single heat pump head in your living room, that's going to be 8,000 bucks. And 30% of that is, is higher than 2,000. So you're going to end up, uh, the, one, the one where you might probably hit 30% instead of um, the cap will be the heat pump water heater. Those are probably four to 5,000 installed. So that one you might just, you might cap out at 30%. But most of the other ones you'll cap out at the uh, dollar limit. I suppose you know you do a a, a a small insulating product project, right? Just blowing some extra cellulose in your attic. Maybe you'll take the thirty percent instead of the full twelve hundred. All right, and that's the twenty five C tax credit for all of these products. Oh, I'll just a uh, quick clarifier. 
this is only for air source heat pumps. So air source, air to air, to air or air to water um, fall into this category. Um, and for all of these, for most of these, there is a, there's an efficiency requirement, right? It has to be of a certain caliber, right? The windows, they have to be energy star windows. Um, the, the other ones are a little less defined. The heat, the heat pumps in particular, the air source heat pumps have to fulfill what's on my screen now. So these are the efficiency requirements of an air source heat pump. It must meet the Consortium for Energy Efficiency's most efficient tier in the North Canada region. So that's CEE. They're a great little organization out of, out of Massachusetts. Um, and they just set these levels last uh, November um, and got caught up in this bill. They were, they were doing a level change anyway, and then the bill got signed and appointed to them. They weren't expecting it. So there's some, there some fun there with CEE figuring it out. But um, these are for, you know, if you're an energy geek and you really look at heat pumps all the time, this might make sense to you, but, you know, this is the, this is the cooling efficiency, annual cooling efficiency. This is the peak cooling efficiency. This is the annual heating efficiency. And this is the efficiency when it's five degrees outside is the way to quickly explain those. And then capacity ratio, this is basically, does it, does it still produce a lot of heat even as it gets colder outside? Um, and so they have, and frankly, these limits are not very limited, right? For where we are in Vermont, um, you wouldn't want to install a heat pump that is worse than this. If you're down in Virginia or Maryland or somewhere a little bit more mild, right? This is this starts becoming a little bit restrictive, right? Like I, you know, the heat pumps I might want to purchase for my climate, which is a little bit milder, these might feel like a bit like overkill to them. But for us, it's like this is what you wanted to do anyway. So it really doesn't limit your equipment options. There's plenty of them, um, and these are fairly good specs to be pointing to anyway. Um, I would actually argue that the one that's it's a little bit weak is the capacity ratio. You, you probably want a much higher capacity ratio than this. But again, that'll be like between you and your contractor to figure out, to specify which heat pump you want. Um, most of the, like the really good, the, the better heat pumps are doing 100% uh, capacity ratio at five to 47. Um, that's what most of the ones that you're seeing installed around here do anyway. All right. The next tax credit, um, the Clean Energy Tax Credit 25D. This covers solar, home batteries, if it's tied to solar, right? You can't just do a home battery without the solar side to qualify for this, um, and ground source heat pumps, um, GSHPs. So uh, again, similar tax credit, no limit, can't run out, available now. This one's also a non-refundable tax credit. You must have the federal tax liability, uh, but this one is 30% of incurred cost uncapped. There's no limit, right? If you spend uh, $40,000, $60,000 on a, like a large home, full ground source heat pump renovation, you can take 30% of that. You can get 20 grand in tax credits. Now, not a lot of people have 20 grand in tax liability. Um, so this one also has a carry forward. So if you use it all up this year or in, you know, over the, for the 2023 um, fiscal year uh, or, or tax year, you can then apply, you can take more of it next year and more of it the year after. So if you, if you if have a lower tax liability, then you can take credit for it. You can keep rolling it over year over year until you run out of the credit. Um, so this is a huge deal, right? For solar home batteries and particularly ground source. So ground source is an amazing, it's a great technology, but it is in terms of, of a heating option and install cost, it's substantially more expensive than air source heat pumps. And with this uncapped um, tax credit and the carryover option, for a lot of homes, it starts putting the, the all-in cost, right? After you've taken all your tax and waited on, to get that money back, it puts the all-in cost pretty close to parity for a whole home air source project versus a whole home ground source project. Um, ground source heat pumps, some people refer to them as geothermal heat pumps, if, if you're more familiar with that term. Um, it's just a, a, a bit of an engineering technical misnomer, but it's some of the conventional terminology uses it. All right, that is 25D. So 25C is capped, 25 for home improvements, a uh, whole spectrum. 25D is uncapped for solar batteries and this one particular home improvement, um, ground source heat pumps. 
Um, the next one is the 45L tax credit. This is for new homes. Um, it also covers gut retrofits. Um, $2,500 for Energy Star Home, $5,000 for the Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Homes Program, which I have been calling Dozier for my entire life until I found out about a month ago that the Department of Energy hates that nickname. So I'm trying to stop using it. And yet it makes so much sense, Dozer, it just flows. Anyway, um, with this one, like the design of this, you know, those aren't huge dollar signals for a new house, right? That's not, that's not groundbreaking. That's not like, that's not paying for your house. Um, it's probably paying for a lot of the energy efficiency upgrades you would need to meet the caliber of Energy Star or DOE zero energy ready um, base versus a baseline. But frankly, the these two programs, the Vermont uh, Residential Building Energy Standard, Arby's, is almost as stringent as Energy Star anyway. Like it's not a big bump up. And this one's also not a big bump up beyond that. So um, they're not huge hurdles to jump in terms of efficiency over current code in Vermont. But at the same time, it's not a big dollar signal. and the reality is that this was designed for big production builders, right? It was designed for KB Homes and Lennar and DR Horton and these big production builders that buy a huge tract of land in California and stamp out 300 homes at once and verify them all. And just, they can just do the verification process on the cheap because they're, they're getting so many homes out of, the, out of the process. They can do sampling and bundle them. It's just easier. For a custom builder, for a single home, Eh, unless you were really keen on these certifications anyway, you might just skip this, right? It might not be worth the, the buck. Um, but it's there. Um, all right, so uh, electric vehicle tax credits. I forgot a word on this slide, so, but you can tell by the picture. We're gonna pivot now into electric vehicles. That covers all the home stuff. Um, in the electric vehicle market. So there's the clean vehicle tax credit. This one is convoluted. This one, a lot of people are like, this one, they really, they really put a lot of bound, like weird asterisks and bounding boxes around it to get this credit. It's gonna be tricky. Um, it's 30D is the, the numbering convention. Um, it is available now with, a, with an asterisk on that, that'll get to. Um, it's up to 7,500 for a new vehicle, again, with an asterisk that I'm going to get to. Um, here are some of the asterisks. It's not available on luxury models. And they define that as $55,000 for a car and $80,000 for an SUV, van, or pickup. So that, that knocks out a lot of cars. That knocks out a big chunk of Tesla's product line. Um, it knocks out like the Ford Mach-E. It knocks out a bunch of sort of the nicer, snazzier um, First, because as those of you who follow the electric vehicle market may recognize, like the, the first electric vehicles to kind of make it and break into the market were luxury vehicles. And that was Tesla's sort of secret sauce. And then other people followed them, Volvo and Ford and others, of really trying to go luxury models first. You know, the the like the Ford the Ford um, F-150 electric, that's a, that's over 80,000 MSRP. So that's out unless they bring down their MSRP to get below this, which some people think they might, we'll find out anyway. So that knocks out a lot. There's also income limits. So this is uh, income limited to, um, these are pretty high income limits, frankly, right? 150,000 for single filers, 300,000 for joint filers, right? So uh, most people, yeah, that, that's like the, maybe the 4% can't, can't get there, something like that. Um, uh, one good thing they did is they lifted the manufacturer cap. So if, if you've looked into the electric vehicle market in the past, it used to be that once you've taken, once a manufacturer has shipped 200,000 units, they no longer got their tax credit, right? So Tesla passed it years ago. Uh, uh, Chevy passed it years ago. Um, and a bunch of the others are like right on the cusp right now. And so this one got rid of those entirely. So Tesla's, at least their Model 3, their, their non-luxury models, and like Chevy Bolt, which is probably the most popular electric vehicle right now in terms of, well, them and Tesla, in terms of volume, like Bolt has not had a tax credit for a few years now. Bolt gets their credit again. So does the Nissan Leaf, which lost it. Uh, Leaf gets it again. So that's huge. That's a big deal for some of these 
um, products that have been out there for a long time that no longer got credit. Um, right now, this is a tax credit that you would have to go take on your taxes. But starting in 2024, these will be transferable to the dealer, making them point of sale, which means when you're at the dealership and you're buying, it's just discounted right there. And you sign a little thing that says tax credit can go to you, Chevy dealer. I'm not going to take it on my taxes. Instead, they take it and you sort of transfer the credit. Um, this is the big asterisk. Um, it requires, a, like has deep requirements regarding domestic material sourcing, processing, and manufacturing. And the, 30, the 7,500 is split up into two buckets. One is on the battery, one is on the rest of the car. I didn't make a slide out of it because it's just like, eh, who cares? Because at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the car manufacturers to navigate all that and tell you which ones are eligible. Um, you know, it, there's like, you know, fine portion of final assembly that has to be in the US of both the vehicle itself and the battery, a portion of the, the raw materials to the battery or and or the processing of those raw materials has to be in the US. Now, luckily in the other portions of the IRA are massive tax credits for building factories to build these, to make the batteries, to make the cars. So right now today, the list of cars that comply with the, the domestic sourcing requirements is pretty small. It's really small. And frankly, the supply of electric vehicles right now is being outstripped by demand even before this tax credit was available. Right? If you went to try to buy an electric vehicle right now new, you'd take a while to find one on the market. Um, so this basically is, you know, you can't find them anyway. This is going to be up to the, the manufacturers to kind of suss out and figure out over the next year. And I wouldn't expect for there to be like a robust uptake of this tax credit until 2024. When the transfer of credit goes to the dealer, when some of those factories have been built, finished, you know, they've been building them for a while, but like, you know, it's, it's going to take a while for the supply chain to catch up to these requirements and really make it ubiquitously available. Um, but you don't have to know the details of what counts or what doesn't. You can, you can go read about it, Google uh, this, and you'll find out. But um, that's how it's going to play out. Um, brand new is a, a used car credit. Never used to be able to get a tax credit on a used car. Now you can. Um, this one's also available now, except same caveat applies. Good luck finding a car that you know, used vehicle that fulfills this, right? So this tax credit, it's, it's up to $4,000 or 30%, whichever is less. Um, the used car must be at least two years old. Um, the sale purchase price must be under 25,000 and you have to buy it through a dealer, not a pri no private sale. Um, has the same income limits for the filer. Um, and then it can be only applied once per vehicle. I have no idea, I guess they'll track that by VIN number, but um, just know that. Uh, so if you can find a used Leaf or a used Bolt or a used Kia Soul, right? Those might be under 25K still, some of them, some of the older models, like 2015, 16. They don't have as big of a range as the more modern mo models, but you might be able to get this credit right now, right? There's no sourcing requirement here. This is just, this is the entirety of the, the requirements. So some of the old BMW i3s, you might be able to find for um, under 25,000, uh, might be able to find. Again, they go very quickly when they get onto dealer lots, but uh, this exists now and you might be able to get this tax credit too. Um, this one also will be, is right now it's not, it's a, your own tax credit and in 2024, it'll be transferable to the dealer. Same deal as the, um, the new cars. And so with that, we're at 610, right on time. I'm done with what I was gonna say to you. So uh, Genevra, what questions do we have? That was, that was fun, Matt. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, um, good. For running through it. Um, Let's see, Michael, do you want to do our first question? Sure. Let's see. And folks, please um, keep entering them in the chat here as they yeah, come. Yeah. Uh, well, the first question is, will it cover geothermal? You already mentioned yep. that it does. Um, uh, when next one is when these, when will these rebate programs launch? Late 2023 is the best advice guidance I have for that, but um, I would expect Hira to launch then, but maybe Homes not until 2024. 
it's just more complicated. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and someone's asking here, what are the rebates for New Hampshire? Um, so the say all of this is federal, right? So in New Hampshire, it's not going to flow through Efficiency Vermont, right? Obviously, it'll probably flow through New Hampshire Saves or uh, New Hampshire's uh, one of the one of the New Hampshire state agencies will tee up something new. We don't know, uh, but these are all federal, so they're going to be the, the same dollar figures, the same requirements apply. It'll just be for those programs that haven't launched yet. They'll go through some state agency in New Hampshire. Thank you. The next question is: Is it known if the low income rebates will be retroactive for people who? installed heat pumps after the IRA was passed, but before the IRA rebate rules and programs were implemented? The answer is, again, we don't know, but that's unlikely. Um, I, I would expect, you know, because most of them are going to have some kind of like participating contractor requirements or, you know, I think it would be unlikely that you can retroactively get those, um, those rebates. But I, that again, that is speculation. There's nothing definitive written that that's the case. But definitely don't bank on it, right? Don't, if you're making a decision now and you're like, I'm going to get those credits when they come through, don't, don't <laughs> make sure that that's not the only, if you're doing it because you're doing it, do it. But yeah, don't, don't bank on it. Thank you, Matt. All right. When researching this earlier, it looked like the HERA rebates only applied when replacing gas appliances and wouldn't be available if you already had electric appliances, even if your existing appliances were old and super inefficient, um, electric resistance range or dryer, for example. Yep. We want to replace our hand-me-down electric range with an induction cooktop and our 1998 dryer with heat pump dryer. Will we be eligible? Again, no one knows. Um, for... I'm expecting, and again, this is such speculation, right? Um, it's not written in the law, it's not public anywhere, but my, my, my guess is that replacing electric resistance water heaters and electric resistance space heating will be covered, but probably not, and, and probably drier, but probably not range, stove range, because both those other three, those are fairly big energy loads where the heat pump alternative is like, three to four times more efficient. And so they're gonna they're gonna want to push that. Whereas an induction stove is not actually more efficient than an electric resistance stove. It's just more convenient and boils faster and is like nicer to work with as a cook. So um, it's not really a, an energy saving move from induction. It, it's a tiny amount of energy, but it's really not very much. So that, that's that's my guess. Thank the next, qu next question is, how will the tax credits interface with the discounts at point of sale for something like a heat pump? So if there's a point, of, if there's a heat pump point of sale rebate that's coming from the utility or the state agency or something other than the federal government, right? So HERA is going to give some point of sale rebates to certain things. Those are income qualified. Um, we expect that you wouldn't be able to then also take the tax credit on top of it. So if you're in that income bracket, and again, that's another piece of speculation. It's not written anywhere. Like it's not definitive. It's just what those who work in this world expect to happen. Right? If you're in that income bracket, you take the HERA point of sale rebate for a heat pump. You can't then, and then you still owed, right? Because it's up as a max of 8,000. So you still owed another 8,000 on top of that because you put in a $16,000 heat pump, you wouldn't be able to take the tax credit on the remainder is, is my expectation. I could be wrong. Um, if you're, if you're, but, but if you are getting a rebate from Efficiency Vermont or uh, Unitel or Liberty or Green Mountain Power on one of these technologies, that is stackable. So it would be, that's definitely stackable on the tax credit. So if they gave you a rebate on your heat pumps, um, your incurred cost for the year is the install cost minus the rebate. That would make the basis of what 30% is applied to. And totally up, to, that one we know is above board. You can stack those. Thank you. 
Um, do these credits happen automatically or do we need to initiate them? Will contractors generally know our options for credits or do we need to be on top of it all? Depends on the contractor. Um, so I, I, I work in a group. We have this, this, uh, this group of contractors that meets once a month down at Salt Hill and we kind of talk and none of them knew about the IRA at all. Right. We did a little IRA. I did a little IRA primer. Some of them did. I'm being unfair. I did a little IRA primer with them. And there was a lot of like, whoa, do we have to know all this stuff? And like those who are, you know, really, you know, like kind of, yeah, we should, right. This is a, this is how you grow your contracting business by knowing these things and communicating them to your customers and helping them navigate their way through it. Um, so the answer is one would hope so, but no, not all contractors will bother to memorize this stuff and learn it and present it to you. Um, for the HERA and the HOMES Act, I would expect that most of those will, have, will require a contractor that is part of like a participating contractors network, right? That means they've kind of signed in to become a program, a contractor that works within this particular Efficiency Vermont program. They've taken some training. They've, you know, agreed that they will help homeowners understand this and get it and that and they'll be the one passed they'll be the one doing the point of sale rebate anyway so on that stuff i would expect those contractors to likely know this because that's like that's why they're in the program that's why they're part of the program supporting it um for the tax credits i would say some will know it and will tell you what to do and some won't um so being on top of this and knowing it is helpful for yourself um also the, the tax credits aren't point of sale Right, the tax credits you got to sit on that money until next January, right? When you or February or March or up to April fifteenth, right? Until the next. So if, if you got a heat pump tomorrow, you don't get your tax credit until you file in twenty twenty four, for for for, and then you get your return. Um, so you'll be sitting on that. You'll be sitting on that tax credit um, cash flow for a long time. Thank you. Daniel's asking, can you name some local contractors who are familiar with ground source heat pumps? I don't know the ground source heat pump contractors locally well enough. Most of my work is in New York State. I know those guys really well, um, but I, I wouldn't want to throw out names in Vermont because I just don't, I don't know them. Um, Dandelion Energy works in New York and they probably cross over. I'm not sure if they come this far. Right, as far as Woodstock, but they're a big New York company that really knows their stuff. Um, and they have a pretty broad service territory, at least in New York. And, and uh, that's the one name I'm willing to put out there. Yeah, and I guess we can, all, yeah, thanks, Matt. I guess we can also say calling Efficiency Vermont and checking their list of contractors yeah. on their website is yep. kind of probably the best you can do. Um, all right, it's a question here from Linda. Is there no end date for the carryover for 25D? Um, I.e., is it possible to finish using a credit in 10, 12, 15 years? So the act is a is a 10-year act. So all of these go away in 2032. And if you haven't rolled it over by then, I'm pretty sure you're done. But I but who like may there might be some little I, I'm not expecting any of these tax credits to that you get a big enough credit to roll over that far. Who knows? Maybe with a huge solar array and battery array and a ground source heat pump all at once, that you might be able to go 10 straight years. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to handle, like if you got this installed in 2030, right? And the rollover really was viable to pass the 2032 mark. I haven't bothered to read what happens then. You might be able to continue rolling it over, but I haven't, I haven't looked actually at that question because it has come up in my mind. So Jennifer, the next question is really one that you could best answer. Oh, uh, well, it's asking where the slide deck can be found. Matt, can I send the slide deck out to everyone registered? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, it will I'll email, I'll, email. I will email it to you yeah. after this. <laughs> Unless I, did I already email it to you? I don't no, not so. yet. Yeah. All right, I'll send it to you afterwards. I noticed a couple typos I'll fix first. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Matt. The next one is, does the battery slash solar credit apply to off-grid? Um, yes. Yeah. As long as it's, it's residential scale and incurred by, uh, by a, a, a person with tax liability. Um, it's really weird, Michael, that wasn't showing up as my next question, but I'll give my next question that I'm seeing. <laughs> um, 
and I can vouch to the off grid thing because I'm off grid and I got that tax credit. Um, any chance of this being repealed? Asks Marv. Always, right? Like you know, we we have a we have a federal government that has one party that seems to not believe very strongly in climate action, and uh, right now, you know, this this next two year period, no, right? We got veto power in the presidency. We own, we, you know, the Democrats have the Senate. Um, I would suggest I would very I'd be very skeptical if this got repealed. Like they couldn't appeal the Affordable Care Act that they literally had people marching in the street against. They're not going to be able to repeal this act that no one like there's no protest to this act. There's no Tea Party movement against it, right? It some people grumbled on the other side on the Republican side of the federal um system, but like I I would be very surprised if this got repealed. It would take a supermajority and a trifecta and real and and to get past all of the constituents who would be harmed by it's really tough to take away tax credits. <laughs> you know, you get a lot of complaints, so you take away people's tax credits. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next one is: Is it best to track the various launch dates through the Rewiring America page? Yeah, they're going to be on top of this. They're a really good organization that knows their stuff. Um, now, the dilemma with that will be some of these will be like state by state, they might be launched at different times, right? So, you know, Vermont might get his act together faster than New Hampshire. I probably guess that's going to be true. Um, so it may be that Rewiring America isn't tracking all the specific states, but, you know, hopefully Efficiency Vermont or whomever puts it together on the New Hampshire side. I don't, I'm guessing it's not going to be a mass, uh, New Hampshire saves because that's a utility program not a state agency program the way Efficiency Vermont is, but I could be wrong. Thanks, Matt. Um, our next question here, what projects could be part of HOMES? I'm a little confused over which projects will be covered under HOMES and which are under HERA. Yeah, they're redundant to each other. Are they, they um, the HOMES one is, we don't know, asterisk, like we don't know exactly what technologies will qualify, but. They, uh, they are kind of, they're working on the same types of home improvements through different mechanisms, right? So one is that point of sale by the line item up to an amount, pretty simple structure, pretty easy to understand. You know, the other one is this much more complicated modeling, modeled or measured savings that'll have all sorts of rules. But yeah, essentially you take the energy model and you say, okay, my house used to have R30, R15 in the attic and really bad windows and an old boiler and an old water heater. And I swapped all that stuff out to really good insulation and really good mechanical equipment. And now it's modeled to use 30% less energy than it used to. Um, that might be your better pathway to credits. I don't know, you know, but you know, then again, you look at the numbers, like it's 8,000 bucks for a heat pump in the HERA Act, and it's up to 4,000 total for your entire house in the Homes Act. So it might be that like you get your heat pump through, through HERA, and then you do your insulation and your like your weather sealing and all of your like your home envelope work through homes. Uh, again, who knows? Like, the, the, we don't have the details yet. Thank you. The next question is a scenario. Um, can you provide a very quick scenario? It says, I want, uh, from Mark, I want to purchase a basic heat pump for one large room. What is the ballpark cost? What is the ballpark out of pocket expense if I utilize available rebates? And then, if possible, the amount of gravy as a tax credit. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the tax credit side because the here stuff isn't open yet. So if you're just buying that, you have tax liability, you know, you can doing just one head in your living room or your bit, your, your open space downstairs is an awesome way to start a decarbonization journey. Just it's, it's one, you know, most of the year in Vermont, we think of our heating season. We're like, oh man, it's the it's those negative 15 degree mornings where you, you know, your eyelashes freeze up as soon as you walk outside. That's, that's what heating is in Vermont. And that's true, but that's true for like 12 hours a year, literally 12 hours a year. It happens, 
and we all experience it. And that's like what we feel is Vermont winter, but most of our winter, it's 35 degrees. It's 28 degrees. It's pretty mild. Um, and so a heat pump in your living room, your, your home's envelope and everything is designed to cover that negative 15 degree day or those hours. And when it's 25 and 30 out, you don't need nearly as much heat. You just don't. And so a single head in your living room can actually provide all of your heating need for your entire house in those conditions often, um, even if it's not designed to cover the whole load when it happens to be negative 15. So you can have a simple heat pump like that that gets 80 or 90% of your annual energy use, even if it's sized, it's not sized to cover those really cold winter nights in February. Um, so total thumbs up for what that's called a partial load solution. Um, very good way of starting your journey. And for that, you can put in a one-to-one -one head for about $8,000 right now. Um, depends, depends on the size of the head, right? How many BTUs it produces, but you can put like a two-ton head for around 8,000 bucks right now. Your tax credit would be 30% of that or $2,000, so 2,000. Um, a smaller head, like a 6,000 BTU head, you might be able to get for like 6,000 maybe. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't think, a, yeah, that's a pretty low right now at, the, at today's prices. So uh, essentially you'd get 2,000 bucks for whatever you put in. It's going to cost you eight to 11,000 to do it, depending on how big of a heat pump you choose. And you'll get a big reduction on your fossil fuel use. Yeah, so thanks, Matt. Go do that. <laughs> Wait, did we do the... Part of the question that's the uh, oh the scenario did I get ever did I did I have everything in there? I don't know. That's what I was trying to check. Okay. Matt's like a heat pump expert, and I feel like it's great because you kind of evangelize about them. Um, the re do we hit through the rebates that are possible? They so yeah, the tax credits you get the two thousand dollar tax credit. Um, the rebates same thing, right? So when Hira is open, um, it's in your if you're below 80% of AMI, it's up to 8,000 for a heat pump. Up, done, right? If you got an $8,000 heat pump, you get the whole thing paid for, down to zero, um, because it's up to 100%. If you're in that 80% to 150% of AMI, like you're earning you know, around $90,000 or $100,000 in your household, um, then you get up to 50% of the cost of your heat pump. So you'd only get four grand on that $8,000 heat pump install. You cover half of it. Um, so in those scenarios, yeah, that those ones can, you know, if you have a if you have a small, you know, 1,400, 1,200 square foot simple house with simple geometry, and you're low income, you could get one head paid for entirely by the bill that covers 95% of your annual heating use, maybe even 100%. Especially if you insulate first, because, you know, in, in all of this, reduce your load first and just make, especially with, with a with a point source heat pump, like a heat pump, a ductless head, right? You got to make sure that if, you know, as the heat gets out to the smaller bedrooms or the bedrooms on the side, that that bedroom's not so leaky that it cools off and you can't get enough heat sort of flowing under the door or through the walls, across the walls, the non-insulated internal partition walls, right? You got to make sure that that heat transfer is fast enough to compete with how much heat is leaving that bedroom through the external walls. Sorry, that's getting pretty geeky into the building science, but. Thanks, Matt. And we have a recording of a presentation Matt gave on heat pumps, if anyone's interested. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's on our YouTube. Um, and the next question is really for me. Um, how and where can we view this presentation again later? It's going to be on our YouTube, and I will send a link out to everyone who's registered for tonight's presentation. So you'll see it there. Um, the next question, has there been any talk of small scale wind to be included in any of these areas like the 25D? Um, I have not, I don't think small scale wind or micro hydro would be the other one you might do as like a residential application as, as getting under 25D. I might be wrong on that. That's not something that I've looked into enough. I guess I should, should pull back. I don't know. <laughs> and next question, do you have to be tied to the grid to access the home improvement credit? Nope. Um, thank you. Tax credits are available for 2022 or 2023. I'm confused. This is a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, tax credits are available for costs that were incurred starting January 1st, 2023. 
So if you if you paid the bill, even if it got installed, uh, that's that that gets a little bit of a gray area. Talk to your tax advisor. Um, but if you paid the bill, my understanding is if you if you got installed and you if you got installed and you paid the bill all in in January, you're good to go. If you cross that line, that one I might want to talk to a tax advisor before claiming it. Nice. And this, and the solar credit existed in, not as part of the act last year as well previously. Yeah. The so solar credit did exist, yeah. So if you had did the solar this past year, you're yeah. eligible. Yeah, 25D with solar and battery both were in 25D before. They just extended 25D um, and added the ground source. Right. Thank you. Can you take uh, tax credit for Windows two or three years in a row if you space out the installation over several years? Yep. Yeah. So 30% of the cost up to 600 bucks per year. And again, it's when, when you incurred the cost. Um, it's 6.30. Do you have time for a few more questions, Matt? Yeah, I can do a couple more. Okay. Um, who will qualify for electric entrance replacement? I don't know what that means, do you? No, entrance replacement. I'm not following that phrasing. Okay. Um, the, that again, again. I want to clarify. Um, we'll do the next one. Uh, for homes, who does the modeling? Do you need to work with a contractor capable of such modeling? Again, we don't know, but sure, but yes, the modeling is going to be regulated of what modeling software platforms are allowed, how it's done, who does it. Um, that's going to probably go through a, a professional contractor who's doing that and getting their work checked. Right. Thank you. This is a really important one. Um, how will the IRA affect new community solar projects? Um, I read about this briefly last night. Um, if it's uh, if it's truly if it's truly community owned, you can take the credit for your portion of the development. Um, that one. You may want to go look that up. I, I'm not. I don't trust my own memory from last night reading it that I quoted that perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there are some complexities to that. The community solar stuff is a little bit weirder, right? Yeah, yeah. there are some changes. Yeah, I would do some research on it. Um, uh, roo rooftop or ground mount on your personal property. That one's clear. <laughs> At least. Um, I wonder if you could give a link comparing heating with heat pumps to oil use in terms of energy used and cost, also propane ranges versus electric and heat pump dryers versus regular electric dryers. Oh, um, it's a lot. I've got I, some of those. Yeah. I don't know if you do too, Matt. Uh, so space heating right now at like this winter's prices, which are starting to come down on the fossil fuel, but maybe I, I think I've last time I did the math, right? It's tough, right? Because prices change. Right, but ballpark picture: propane and oil, a heat pump costs fifty percent less in terms of fuel cost at typical efficiencies, um, and the the prices as they were about two months ago, which maybe they've come down since then. But yeah, you know, what are they going to be next winter? What are we the rest of this winter? I don't know. Is Putin going to invade another country? Like who knows? So, but oil against oil and. You know, number two, heating oil and propane heat pumps are cheaper to run, um, even on our fairly high electric rates in Vermont. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go back to Chris's question. Who will qualify for electric entrance replacement? And he means by that the electric box. Oh, who can do that that work? Yeah, or qualify. Yeah. Yeah, any get that covered. Yeah, I mean, if it's going to hear a side of it, maybe it has to be a like participating contractor, but um, any electrician, you know, certified electrician, I'm sure. And is there that. any qualifying for the participant, like the resident? Any qualification? No, I mean, it, it has to, what they install has to be, uh, it has to go to 200 amp service. It won't, like, if you're up, if you're going from 60 amp to 150, that doesn't count, right? They, they have to, it has to get. It either ha yeah, it has to already be a 200 amp and you're doing some wiring changes or the service panel upgrade has to get you to 200 amps or higher. That's the one qualifier I do know. Um, 
this one here might be our last, but I want to get it in. I'm currently eligible for HERA, but waiting for the heat pump to be installed. Should I hold off until later this year to qualify? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, probably. You could just take the tax credits if you have tax liability. Um, my heart feels for you that we just don't have the answer to that right now. Yeah, risky proposal. Um, yeah. And how will the hero, the last one, how will the hero program announce when it's open? When will we know? Which, efficiency, yeah, efficiency yeah. remodel, say yeah. something, some point, right? Or, and, you know, those of us who geek out on this, we'll put it on the listservs and, you know, you know, Sustainable Woodstock will post it out on some, email, like, you'll hear from us, the same people yeah. that are you're <laughs> hearing your energy information from already. We'll try to echo that signal when it exists. Um, I know I will. I'll put it on the Stratford listserv, and I know you know Ginevra will for the Woodstock group. So, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah, yeah. All right, I think that's all of them. <laughs> Thank you so great. much. Matt. That was great. Yeah, cool. thanks, Matt. Well, that's amazing how much you've gotten all of this uh, under your belt in such a short time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's complex. So we really appreciate you. Um, answering all these questions especially yeah, yeah well glad to be here thanks, thanks for hosting and have a good night you too yeah. good night thanks everybody <laughs>